Hi, my name is Manav. Today I'm going to be talking about what it was like using a custom backend for PyTorch, why I did it, why we bothered, and um, how it was like. I think really what this is is an investigation. So it's not a hard-hitting talk. It's not a sales pitch. I know you may have heard a couple of those. No hate on anyone else. But this is just going to be investigating what it was like actually going through the process of doing that for Torch.compile, as well as the results that I experienced on my end. Um, yeah. I've also noticed there haven't been too many slides introducing the speaker, so I figured I would do that. Hi, I'm Anav. I am a two-year into the industry person, so expect not a huge amount of knowledge, and that's okay because that's what learning is about. Uh, I work at Microsoft. I'm at AI Frameworks as a product manager, and my team, yeah, we work on Onyx and Onyx Runtime, but again, today is an investigation. Short agenda, why bother? That was the problem. How I decided to solve it, what I used to solve this problem, and then the experience results, and then some next steps. Not too complex. Now this, I'm sure everyone's heard before. Inference is expensive. I'm sure, I, I left the quote generic because I feel like people say this all the time. Inference is costly, and we look for so many ways to make it cheaper. Now, there's a lot of options that have already been discussed, whether it be like using better hardware, optimizing that hardware, et cetera, but this is a big problem. Today, we're gonna be talking about Torch.compile, so obviously there's something there. Uh, a model, obviously, is a, com a combination of hundreds of tens of operations. Some are cheap, some are expensive. There are many, many smart people in the industry who work really hard to make these matrix multiplications as optimal as possible. I'm not gonna talk about optimizing any of those today because so many people do that. We have hardware for that, and we have a lot of kernels already doing that really well. We literally spend millions of dollars making technology do that. There's also cheap operations and moving data and that is what I'm going to spend a little bit more time talking about today. Those can, over the course of a whole model and inferencing with one, have similar cost to these big matrix multiplications. And this kind of comes to the problem. Making a model faster by even one or two percent is actually a difficult problem and is hard to do if you're just doing it in pure Python. We write these models pretty effectively and we have some great developers in the community. That's why they're so good. So great, we're kind of into a dead end. How do we exactly spend time? Uh, to, to save these models money and, and time. How do, we, how do we make them faster? And the solution is to look into our models. So I'm using CodeLama as an example because it was really easy to run and it's what we did in investigation. I promise if you try other models, you're gonna have a similar experience, but this is what we used. In profiling, we found out that CodeLama is about two-thirds matrix multiplication, and like I mentioned earlier, those are pretty complex operations and already really optimized, but it's also one-third element-wise operations. So these ones are places where we actually have some opportunities for improvement because they could be matrix multiplications instead. Now, again, it's already really optimized, and most deployments already have really good ways to optimize. So this element-wise operation area is where we can actually eke out the most performance that we haven't already. Great, now we need to know how exactly we do that. How do we make these element-wise operations more efficient? Well, that's where we come to the solution. It's a backend. Now, I'm using Onyx Runtime today because I work in Microsoft and that's what we do, but it's not a sales pitch and I promise that that's the case. So, you know, whether it be um, TensorRT, whether you, whether you want to use OpenVINO or Inductor, use whatever you need, but this is what I'm going to be talking about today. Everything should be pretty generic, though. Cool thing about these custom backends is they already have these fuse nodes. So when we have element-wise operations, we don't have to worry too hard because they have some baked in. We can also do local, local observations based on hardware. So obviously, backends from different companies have different incentives, but these hardware optimizations are made so that they can run better on given hardware. Onyx Runtime also has options for that, and that's great. A backend will allow us to do that. Now, the other thing is that if we're actually going and customizing these models ourselves, it's supposed to be pretty easy to write these kernels. In this case, C++, but if you want to write Triton kernels, be my guest. Now, specifically, the caveats with Onyx Runtime, you have to convert an FX graph into Onyx. Every backend will have some way of using these possible nodes as it goes through the graph, rewriting them into, um, into matrix multiplications. And then at the end, we'll load this optimized graph with all the custom kernels that we've written, and we now have, hopefully, a faster model. So again, this is an investigation. This is what's supposed to happen. We'll see if it actually did and how that works. So in my case, I first went by converting the model to Onyx. So that was like torch.onyx.export, uh, and that was cool. And then I went into the graph and did some looking for different sequences of places that I could try to do some optimization. So I looked for little element-wise operators. I found these candidates to fuse, and especially where they existed in multiple 
occurrences in the model, those were where we had lots of opportunities for improvement because they exist multiple times. You kill many birds with one stone, and that's awesome. So we start by writing some Python code to fuse these operators. So in this case, we have a sigmoid and a, and a multiplication, and we write it as a small sigmoid so that it recognizes as such in the graph. And then we implement the corresponding kernel in C++. Uh, I don't know how well the code's showing up there, but it's not a crazy complex matrix multiplication that happens in this case. It can get more complex depending on how many operators you want to fuse and what they look like. But it's really straightforward. You write that, and then you move on. You find other places in the graph where we can do the same thing. We measure, and then we move to the next candidate. So measuring is just you know profiling and running that number to see, A, if the fusion worked, which it should, and then B, what performance gains we've got out of it. Here's a dummy model. We use a small llama model to start, and here's the performance that we were able to get, which is kind of cool. So just the, op the, the, the general you know, running it on our next runtime gave about a 4.6% improvement, which is great already. We got 8% by having the custom kernels from Onyx runtime automatically run, and then writing those experimental kernels brought us all the way up to 16%, which is really great, right? End of the talk, we had this awesome time. This little model was so much more optimal, and we got 16% performance improvements, yay. Not exactly. There are scripts to kind of see and like replicate that information. They're all in the presentation. Feel free to look at them. But this talk would be a little short if that's all that happened. In reality, that's not what happened at all. The investigation kind of proved a little iffy. We actually had better performance in Eager than if we were to like convert to Onyx Runtime or like to Onyx and then you know run all the custom kernels from Onyx Runtime and then run our own custom kernels or write our own custom kernels and implement those as well. One thing that we did notice, though, was a clear trend in that when you add these custom kernels and these fusions, you are getting better performance gradually. We also learned later this had to do with conversion, and actually there are gains to have. But really what this did is we were able to see what the experience was like and really comment on that. So let's do some commenting. Let's talk about the successes, the errors, and other notes that we had. So after first setting up this graph, it was actually not too hard to find candidates to fuse operators. It wasn't too hard to figure out how to implement them and then actually go about the process of doing so. So that's really good. Bonus points to Torch.compile for making that really easy to do, and then bonus points to any of the backends making that really easy to do as well. Exporting a model into this FX graph also came with a lot of surprises. The API is stable, but the graph that we got actually would vary based on how we exported it. So that was a really interesting thing to learn. And control flow is still really difficult to handle, and that caused graph breaks. This was problematic. The other thing that we learned is that in this process, there's always something the documentation doesn't answer. And I think as developers, this is like a learning that we've experienced many times. It's not always straightforward to come to a solution, and even harder to find docs that will tell us that which, which is the best way to go about that. And so digging deeper required a lot of tough work, and more examples are always appreciated. This is a call to everyone. When you're writing code, when there are things to look at, and when you, run, when you come into experiences, try to share it with the community, because people will benefit from their experiences. I wish it was as easy as saying kernel fusions could just be the kernel code that was built into every runtime, but finding kernels that are custom are hard to find, they're hard to reuse, and personally, what worked really well for me is just finding a tool that, that was the thing that I was most experienced with, so in this case it was C++ and then writing those kernels. But the biggest thing is find things with examples. Find big developer communities where you can do that because that, was, that made writing custom kernels a lot easier for me when I did it. So there are actually some good things to share. Some of the results weren't as bad as we expected. Specifically, there were problems with the FP32, and when we dropped to FP16, we saw some market results, and this is great. Custom kernels are great, and also any kernels that backends provide for you, again, whether that be Inductor, or TensorRT, or OpenVINO, or Onyx Runtime, you will see gains, and that's really cool. We saw very little from just running ORT in general, but when we started activating the kernels that already are built in, we saw 8.4% performance improvements, and then the custom kernels that we wrote also gave us an extra percent of performance improvement. So it's good to know that we can be faster, we can be cheaper, and everyone can be happy, and there's so many different places in the stack that we can optimize. This is specifically run on a V100. So nothing crazy, but it worked and worked just fine. Next steps. Obviously, the, op the obvious answer is just continue fusing ops. Now, for me, again, not being the most experienced person, this takes a lot of time and a lot of effort doing that and going through that process. So maybe I'll leave it to my optimization team next time. But it's good to know that we can eke up performance from these models, even ones that we've seen a lot, as long as we spend the time going into the models, looking at where we can find places for improvement, and then making that improvement. And this varies from hardware, of course, and doing it better for hardware that we're aware of is important. And obviously, the other thing is share, right? So in my case, it was to move these kernels to places where other people could use them. In the case of my backend, I encourage you all to do that for everyone. There's so many different instances where this occurs. 
Now, the interesting thing is there's still a lot of open questions after doing all this investigation. There were situations where multiple element-wise operations existed, but you had to choose between fusing the left node or the right node. And that becomes a problem because these are massive graphs. This is a branching tree. Do I choose the left node, the right node? How do I know which one's best? How do I know what node I want to fuse without actually going through the effort of doing it, then actually running the benchmarks? That was a really challenging thing to think about. Fusing or moving the execution to another device is another question. Do I go through the effort of writing the custom kernels or is there something else I should try? Looking at static fusion and dynamic fusion is another question as well. And then of course control flow is always mind boggling. It was a really inve interesting investigation for me though because I learned what it was like to optimize a model and also how easy torch.compile made it. There were obviously some outstanding questions and stuff like that so if you have any of the answers feel free to reach out afterwards. But it was really interesting for me to go through this process and see what it was like to show that it is possible to have gains across the stack of inferencing with the model. And that's all I have. Thank you so much for listening. It was a really great experience doing this and really great to know how Torch.compile works as well as you know, the great tooling that has already been set up by the PyTorch developer ecosystem. If you have any questions, there is code available on the website or, or like on, on all the links that include a lot of information so you can see what the whole process was like end to end. But otherwise, thanks for listening. <laughs>